through some of this, so I apologize for that. I'm going to dive in. We're still going to be looking at some lessons from Ethiopia that the Lord has kind of laid on my heart that I think were for me, and I think that God was trying to tell me something, but I don't know if you know this or not, sometimes God actually has more than one purpose for the same thing. And so I think it's necessary that as the Lord's dealing with me on things, that it might help in some of your walks to, to understand what the Lord is talking about and dealing about. And so you heard me start last week talking about this chaos that I saw all around me. And the primary focus of that chaos was everywhere you looked, there were unfinished buildings, buildings that they'd started but not finished. So I, I, put, I brought up a couple pictures. Let's put the first one on there. This is actually literally, no joke, right across the street from our hotel in Adis. So literally, you look out the window and you expect a great view, and instead you get this unfinished concrete building. And if you look, you see the wooden structures. Well, that's a fun noise. You want, you want to mute the computer, see if it's coming from the computer? But if you look, there's some horizontal and vertical wooden sticks there. That's scaffolding. So a bunch of crazy Ethiopian people take eucalyptus branches that are about this big, stand them up against a building, and just nail them to a brick building, and then just put pieces of platform across them. That's what they work on. And I got to thinking to myself, well, I don't think OSHA would approve of that. But that's everywhere you look. So I thought, maybe it's just this one building. So we went to another building. Let's go. Oh, look, they don't even have scaffolding. That's just wide open spaces. Just fall, you know. So if you were going out there, that, fit, that building had nobody work on it the entire time we were there because they had run out of money. So they had to wait and save some more money. So the building sits empty. And so what they would do now, a lot of people would use that and light fires on the different levels to keep warm at night. Let's go to the next one. Same thing. Everywhere we turned, unfinished building after unfinished building after unfinished building. And I, I couldn't get the picture in the right format, but it wasn't just businesses and, and home buildings either. It was also, I actually have a picture of one of the Eastern Orthodox temples that it wasn't finished either, and it just had scaffolding going over the dome of it. Everywhere you went, unfinished building after unfinished building next to maybe a run-down shack of a building, and those two might actually be next to a really nice finished building. Our hotel, the one where we're right across the street from that spot, there's rubble and debris and everything else there, and right across the street we had one of the nicest hotels I'd stayed in. So you could have a really nice finished building right next to a shack, and then that's right next to an unfinished building at the same time. There was no rhyme or reason to anything. It reminded me a lot of Florida. If you've ever gone to, not commercialized Orlando, Florida, so if you've ever been to some of the places that aren't commercialized, like my family's from Pensacola, Florida, you can drive down the road and you can see this big open landscape with a giant mansion there. And then turn about 10 degrees to the right and here's someone with a 1960s mobile home right next to it. They, didn't, they don't believe in neighborhoods there. They just, wherever you can put a spot, and I've owned this land, it's mine, and I'll put whatever I want here. And so you can have mansions. They had to make those rich people nuts, right? Living next to a, a mobile home that's got cars stacked on blocks and everything else. But it's kind of the same thing. Just so you know, I'm just going to warn you, I'm preaching without notes again, so <laughs> who knows where this is going to go. <laughs> Two or three days went by seeing these unfinished buildings everywhere. It didn't matter if I was in Addis Ababa. It didn't matter if I was in Hosanna. It didn't matter if I was in Otoro. It didn't matter if I was on a road anywhere in between. Unfinished building after unfinished building. Or some of the, some of the things were built. We, so we passed one. It was intended to be a greenhouse. So they had the poles up and everything. And these poles on both sides of the road went for a mile and a half. So a huge greenhouse... The problem was apparently it went belly up, and so there was no plastic or anything on the greenhouse. It was just the bars. This is the environment that we dealt with. And the, just there was something about unfinished buildings that 
bothered me in my spirit. Not like, boy, they ought to finish that. But de deep down, like, what is it about these buildings that bothers me? What is it that is making me uneasy spiritually about these unfinished buildings? And I was praying one night, reading in my Bible. We just got back from a long day in Otoro. And when I say a long day, long four-wheel drive, rivets down to China drive. And then you get there and you're just, you're in this village swarmed with children all day long, which is fantastic until it's not. And you get home and you're just like, oh man, I just want to lay down. You get back to the hotel. And I'm praying and I'm reading, God, what do you want me? And then he reminds me, and I really felt him saying, you remember those empty buildings that have been bothering you so much? He really impressed on me that, that, that Ethiopia, primarily Addis, the capital, was kind of a story or a picture of my own life. And I think this might be a picture of some other people's lives in here. There are portions of my life that are in absolute shambles, like the shacks that I saw that were falling over. Portions of my life where, man, I just, I can't do anything right in those portions of my life. I don't know if any of you guys can relate to that, but I have parts of my life that I just can't seem to figure out. And I just complete shambles. I have other parts of my life where God has done a really amazing work and it's somewhat finished and polished, like those hotels and things like that that are polished. But then there are other parts of my life where God is still working on me. It's not finished. In fact, it doesn't even resemble finished, but it's a work that God keeps doing in my life over and over and over again. I don't know, maybe there's nobody else in this room, but one of my biggest struggles is I could be branded by what the Bible would call a hothead. I struggle with my temper. And every time that I think I might have it somewhat under control, that God has worked this thing in my life, there is something that wells up in me, there's something that comes from the outside, and my temper wants to rear its ugly head again. And again, and again, and again. And the problem is, when guys like me have bad tempers, see, I'm not a physical fighter. I'm a sarcastic person. So I can rip someone to shreds just by the words of my mouth. And this is something that I know is a problem for me, and I, and I know that God has been working on, but it's just not finished yet. Trust me, if you knew me 15 years ago, I'm much better now than I was before. Ask my wife. Well, she's maybe. I'm, I am much better. If you knew me when I was a middle schooler, you would say, this is not even the same person. I was telling a story to, to Carolyn Harkness, Harkless this morning, Harkness this morning, excuse me, can't talk, where my dad, I was a very mouthy child, I know, hard to believe. Very hard to believe. But I was awful to my mother. Awful. When I was a little older than Malachi, just, again, this mouth was pretty sharp. And one day my dad comes home, my mom's in her room crying because I have destroyed her yet another day. And my dad was very abundantly clear that apparently I'm not going to be able to beat this out of him because I've tried. So my dad was not one that spared the rod. I got many whoopings, but this was not working. And so dad finally one day decided he's going to cure me of this deal with my mouth. So one day he decided, and he'll verify this if you ask him, he decided, here's what I'm going to do. Starting today, when you wake up in the morning, when you come home from school, and when you go to bed at night, you are going to quote Proverbs 10, 19. Three times a day, times 365 days, did it for a year. I can't remember what the math was, but I said that verse a lot. And to this day, when someone says, do you know what Proverbs 10, 19 says? I can tell them, where there are many words, transgression is unavoidable. He who holds his tongue is wise. And what that means is, when you talk too much, you can't help but sin, so shut your face. That's what it means. That's in modern day lingo. That's in JB lingo. But this is something that 
God's working on me, and it's not finished. And I'm sorry, if you've been on the receiving end of that, I'm sorry. It's something that God is working with me on, but it's not finished. So I've got these, these parts of my life. Some of it God says, you know what, we're going to work on that later. Some of it God's working on me right now, and it's, a, it's not a finished product. Some of it's good, and I realize that, well, that really stinks, because I really thought that once you become a Christian, that things were just better. But that's not the case. The Bible talks about a process of what we call sanctification. We are, when we get saved, when we give our life to the Lord, there's a thing called justification, which means that basically, if you want a definition, it means just as if I have never sinned, which means God takes my sin, removes it from me, casts it as far as the east is from the west, and then he imparts his righteousness to me, his righteousness, not mine. That's justification. That's salvation. That's what happens when you give your life to the Lord. He removes your sin from you and gives you his righteousness. But there is a physical process on this planet called sanctification where over and over and over again, God continually through struggle, pain, joy, valleys, mountains, through all of our experience, God begins to mold us and shape us into the image of Jesus Christ. And he uses everything in our life to do so. But I want to be complete. And I began to get discouraged. Like, God, there are way too many things in my life that are not close to finished. <laughs> and I'm 41. I'm going to be 42. You've been working on me for 25 years now, and I'm still not figuring this stuff out. How in the world am I ever going to get there? How in the world is this ever going to happen? And I began to get depressed. And I began to think through the Bible, and God began to show me some passages of Scripture. And I want us to look at, the, look at a couple of passages of Scripture real quick. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1. I began to realize that unlike most men that I know, God finishes his projects. Nobody caught the sarcasm there. That's good. Unlike most men that I know, God tends to finish his projects. I know too many men start a project I, 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 we went to a church where the pastor was working remodeling their kitchen and then like eight years later I go over to his house for dinner and I lean against the island and the counter slides all the way off the island because he still hadn't secured the counter to the island eight years after they began the remodel project <laughs> so, so this is my, kind of my experience but then I, you, you look at Genesis chapter 1 starting in verse 28 and God blessed them and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have for them for food. And to every beast of the earth and to every bird of the heavens and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So God, when God starts on day one, and he's got nothing but a clean slate, the Bible says that the earth was void and formless. The spirit hovered over the darkness of the water. He's got a blank slate, and he begins to let there be light. He begins to bring order to the chaos of what he had just created, to the chaos of the earth. He begins to bring light. He begins to separate land from water. He begins to bring life onto the planet. He begins to do all these things. But the one thing we have to be sure of, this is probably the stark contrast between the world, Christian worldview of creation and the worldview of evolution, is on the sixth day, he was done. He was complete. The world was finished. And not only was it finished, it was very good. It was Every other day, one through five, the, everything he'd done, and God saw that it was good. But on the last day, when he finished everything and put man in the garden, it was very good. 
complete, finished. And you compare that to the other worldviews of the, of the world, and they will tell you that this is just an ongoing process that will never be finished. We're always constantly evolving, always constantly changing, always constantly, the earth is always changing and moving. To a certain degree, that's true, but that's because of sin in the world. The sin brought the fall, and the fall changed and radically changed the world. But when God was finished with creation on day six, he was done, and it was complete. God is obsessed with completing the things that he started. We can look at another instance of God's completing things that he started. In the theological world, we would believe that this is not a conglomeration of 66 books. This is one book that tells a single solitary story of redemption. That God, out of his love for himself, out of his love for between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, created the world and created mankind in his image to share his love and his grace to share all those things, and he knew from the beginning of time that man would reject him, and so before time began, he began a plan or a process of bringing about redemption, and it's a long process according to human standards. It started in Genesis 3, goes all the way through the story of the Israelites, and it culminates in Jesus on the cross. This one story of redemption. And I want to read John chapter 19 for you because it's very, all of a sudden it gives you a very good picture. John chapter 19. John chapter 19 and starting in verse 28. Jesus is on the cross here and, and it says this, after this, Jesus, listen to this, knowing that all was now finished. This 2,000-year story of redemption has met its completion, its finishing, with Jesus hanging on the cross. Said, now finished, said to, fu to fulfill the scriptures, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. So in our timing, in the what seems like a long time to God is just but a breath, and God tells the story of redemption. And at the Bible says that at the right time, at just the right time, Christ died for us. He wasn't early. He wasn't late. At just the right time, Christ died for us, completing the story of redemption, or at least the purchasing back of his people. There will be a complete ending in the book of Revelation where the entire world is redeemed back to God, not just people. But the redemption of a group of people that he has called was finished on that day. I want you guys to know this, and we're going to go into some very personal stuff. God is obsessed with finishing everything that he started. Everything. Everything. And here's the kicker. That includes you and me. He is not one that will leave us in a condition of unfinishedness. And the Lord really began to pour on my heart Philippians chapter 1. We like to quote verses out of context. I don't know if you've known that about the human race. We like to pick one verse and read it and apply that to our lives, but then not look at the verses before it or the verses after it. So I want to look not just at the one verse, but I want to look at the entire context. Philippians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Paul is writing to a church in Philippi that he started. And 
He knows that there's things in here. He's yearning to see them. He's yearning to be with them again. And this is what he writes. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now listen to this. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense of and confirmation of the gospel, for God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. First of all, amen. First of all, I am sure of this that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I am sure of this. That was, this is not a, this is Paul saying, look, I am not, I'm not wishy-washy about this at all. I am sure, not even confident, you know, because sometimes confidence is actually misplaced, right? Sometimes people are confident about something that they probably should not be confident about. As, a, as an IT person, as a computer person, when I had people who um, basically typed on a computer but had no idea about taking a computer apart or doing anything, trying to tell me what they knew was wrong with their computer really is misplaced confidence. So he's not saying I'm confident because confidence leads to the ability or the possibility that he's wrong, that God won't bring to completion. I'm confident that he will, but it's possible that he won't. But that's not what he says. He says, I am sure, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt, I know that I know that I know that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it at the day of Christ. He's sure of it. Well, that raises a different question to me. What makes him so sure? And I love what he said immediately after that verse. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. And here it is. For you are all partakers with me of grace. And how do we know we're partakers of grace? Both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. This church was willing to go to prison with Paul. This church was willing to suffer persecution with Paul. This church was willing to loudly defend the gospel with Paul. This church was loudly able to confirm the gospel, that the gospel that their lives had been changed. How do you confirm the gospel? We show people that this person was this way, and after Jesus Christ, they were radically changed for the glory of God. They were able to confirm the gospel. And because of these things, because they were willing to suffer, because they were willing to be in prison, because they were willing to die, because they were willing to show forth the confirmation of the gospel in their life, that they had been radically transformed into the image of God, and because of the fact that they were willing to stand and defend it, even when it doesn't make a lot of sense, and there are times where the gospel doesn't make a lot of sense, it makes zero sense, but they defend it at all costs, that was proof enough to Paul to say, I'm sure that he who began a good work in you will be faithful to bring it to completion. And I want to stand here today with you guys. Maybe, maybe nobody else here, but I find myself frustrated with myself. I find myself constantly 
on the failures block. Constantly not living up to my own expectations. And my thought process, my natural inclination to say, you know what, I failed this time, but I am going to do better next time. I will do it. I will accomplish it. I am going to work harder. I'm going to do this. And if you notice the subject of that sentence was, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And that's not what Philippians 1 is saying. The, it is saying, for he who began a good work in you, which means Jesus Christ began a good work in you. He who began a good work in you, that person is far more faithful than you are. And I am. Jesus, let's just slow that down. Jesus Christ is far more faithful than you or I are. He's far more faithful, and he loves you and knows you more than you love and know yourself. And that person, Jesus Christ, he will bring the work to completion. It is not up to us to bring about perfection because we are incapable of bringing that standard up. We can do things to be intentional. We can do things to, to spiritually be aware. But I will tell you this, when it comes to God working in your life, you will be far better served to spend every morning on your knees, first of all, asking God to forgive you and repent of your sins, and secondly, asking God to continue the work in your life earnestly. Because when you try and bring about change in your own life by yourself, apart from the Holy Spirit, what ends up happening is you end up glorifying yourself in the process. Look what I did. This is why drug addiction is so hard, right? Because what happens when people try and do it on their own, they'll kick habits for a while. And trust me, I have a lot of experience with friends and family who have been addicted to drugs. And I've watched this happen over and over and over again. They'll kick it for a while, and then they will sit there and all on their own. They'll kick it for a while, and then they'll say, look, I beat it all on my own. I don't need that God stuff. I don't need any of that. I beat it on my own. This is why alcoholics will always tell you I'm always alcoholic. Even when I'm not drinking, I'm still an alcoholic. Why? Because I can't do that. I can't get past it on my own. I can't do that. I, I will sit there and brag about myself. I'm six days clean or six months clean, and I did it all on my own. And every time that someone has said that to me, it's not a short time later, and that person I've had to drag out of the belly of a drug den because they tried to do it on their own. They tried to change themselves. You know, we have these fun little phrases that we use. We've got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps. I don't even know what that means. I don't, I've never had a strap in my boot ever. I've never even had a boot. <laughs> so, I don't know what it means by pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But this idea in American culture is that we are individuals, and doggone it, we're going to do it by ourselves. The problem is you can't. The Bible says that the heart of man is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who on earth can know it? You can't even know the depth of the depravity of your own heart because it's deceiving you constantly. But if you allow God to radically transform, if you seek the Lord and you say, God, I need you to change this in me, what you will find what you will find is that God will use all these circumstances of your life to constantly bring about change that you don't know about. You don't even know that you're being shaped in his image. The Bible says that we are being transformed into the image of his dear son, and here's what it says, from glory to glory to glory. Meaning it's not from glory to glory to glory in heaven, hallelujah. No, he is changing us into his image from one instant, one glory, to the next one, to the next one. And if we will stop and allow God to work at us and work on us in our most painful moments, in our biggest suffering moments, 
in the moments where it seems like there is no way out. If you'll stop and let God move and let God speak to you through his word, through his church. Sometimes it's through the sayings and phrases of a little child. If you were in Sunday school this morning, David Platt talked about that, how he was in the Himalayas and a little child just wanting some of his food. And they told him that you're not supposed to give him and give these people any of your food because we're trying to do a more sustainable work here. So he pulled his hand away and turned away from the child. And in that moment, God spoke to him and said, that is what you do to need all the time is you turn away from it instead of running to it. God will radically move you and transform you if... if you let him. Because here's the problem. God is never going to force you to do anything. He's not. Very rarely in Scripture do we see God forcing people to do something that they don't choose to do. There are a couple of instances where it seems that way when the Apostle Paul was Saul and he became Paul. It didn't seem like the Lord left Paul a lot of options on the table, <laughs> but, but he knocked him off of his horse. And when the Apostle Paul saw the glory of God, I love his response. The Apostle Paul sees the glory of Jesus Christ. Remember, Apostle Paul had been killing Christians just the day before. And he sees the glory of Jesus Christ, and his response was so telling. Who are you and what do you want from me? Who are you and what do you want from me? And I will tell you this, that if we will honestly seek the Lord and we will honestly seek that the glory of God would fill this place in ways that we haven't seen, if we see the glory of God, there's only one response that is actually adequate. Who are you and what do you want from me? I'll do it because I know that your glory is far greater than my glory. Your honor is far greater than my honor. You clearly are a being that thinks and acts and moves in ways that I cannot possibly fathom in this little, tiny, finite body. But understand this. God doesn't bring something to the completion by forcing you to do something. He will take you around the mountain over and over and over again until you get it. That's why I'm still working on my temper. Oh, you didn't get it this time? Another time around the mountain. Oh, you still don't want to get it this time? Another time around the mountain. That is why Israel spent 40 years in the desert. They come around once, still grumbling and complaining about the manna. Okay, let's do it again. They go around Mount Sinai again. Oh, still grumbling and complaining again. All right, here we go again. 40 years! Sorry, that was loud. I would like to think that I'm not as dense as that, that it would take 40 years to get something across. But guess what? We are thick-headed. The Old Testament calls it this way. They are a stiff-necked people. But I'm sure of this. If we will allow the Lord to soften our hearts, and we will seek Him, and we will defend and confirm the gospel, if we will be willing to suffer any and all for the sake of Christ, if we're willing to do that, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you and me will be faithful to complete it. And he, I love the fact that he didn't make us wait to find out when. Did you hear that last part? At the day of Christ. When the Bible says that he, the clouds will split open, let me paint a beautiful picture for you. One day, the clouds in heaven will split open, and we're going to hear a trumpet. And we'll hear a voice from heaven that says, Arise, my love, my fair child. 
and those who shall come will come, and we will meet him in the air, and we will rule and reign with him forever. That is the day of Christ. At the day of Christ, we will gaze on the face of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says we will see him for as he is, and we will be instantly changed and complete in the image of Jesus Christ. And that, to me, I can't speak for you. That day for me is worth any ounce of persecution, any ounce of pain and struggle, any ounce of ridicule for the gospel's sake. We've heard this phrase a lot in our society in the last couple of weeks. They're on the wrong side of history. I don't know if you've heard that in the news a lot. They're just on the wrong side of history. If they don't believe this, they're on the wrong side of history. I don't really care if I'm on the wrong side of history. I want to be on the right side of the day of Jesus Christ. And if that makes me on the wrong side of history, I'm perfectly okay with that. But I'm telling you, this isn't just a game that we play or a feel-good thing. This is something very real. That if you, the Bible is very clear, that those who will not acknowledge me before men, I will not acknowledge before my Heavenly Father. The gospel is not a, just a fun little thing. It's very serious. And we're to defend it and confirm it with everything that we have. And if we will, that day of Christ will be a wonderful experience for us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this day. God, I thank you that you don't leave it up to me to finish the completion process. Because God, I can mess that one up too. seems that everywhere I turn I mess it up I feel like the Apostle Paul those things I do want to do I just can't find myself to do those things I don't want to do those things I do all the time and who's going to save me from this body of death thanks be to Jesus Christ our Lord and God I invite you into my life into my heart into to finish the work that you started. To keep working, keep chiseling, keep moving. God, I don't care how uncomfortable it is. I don't care how painful it is. I don't care how many tears I have to shed. God, I don't care. I want to be like you. I want to be finished and do whatever it takes. God, I pray that for this church, that what you began 150 years ago, that first of all, God, I pray that us as a congregation, us as a people, will seek you and yearn to be what you want us to be, will humble ourselves before you. And God, if we'll do that, we pray that you would come in and you would no matter how painful, no matter how much struggle, that, God, you would bring your plan for this church to completion at the day of Christ. And we will be faithful and we will be sure to make sure that we know that any good work and all good works are nothing but a gift from the glorious grace of Jesus Christ. God, continue to move. In Jesus' name, amen.